So um, it seems LGBTQ folks in general aren't saving for emergencies or for retirement because we feel like we don't have enough money to keep up with the cost of living and inflation. But the reported household income isn't significantly lower than the general population or um, who, are, who are saving for relatively more for emergencies and for retirement. Um, any idea why we think this might be? And this is a discrepancy in what uh, data that we have seen in the past? Yeah, so this was interesting, right? We asked folks what their income was uh, in kind of like an income bracket. And on the whole, um, the similar percentage of LGBTQ plus folks that we surveyed were making uh, less than 75,000 a year and as similar as, as the national population. And a similar percentage, obviously, then were making more than 75,000 a year uh, compared to the national population. Um, but then we had these numbers that suggested that LGBTQ folks uh, were saving less uh, despite making a similar amount. Um, so yeah, there's something going on there, right? Um, I think there could be any number of reasons why that could be the case. You could just chalk it up to um, folks spending more money. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If you're spending within your means and you're spending on things that improve your own well-being, spend away. Um, I will say, you know, we asked in our survey why uh, you're not saving um, as much. Uh, and so 42% said they just aren't making enough money. Um, over a fifth said they're happy with the amount that they're saving. So that's a, that's a good takeaway. As long as they're kind of saving about, they have about 15 to 20% of their salary in savings, that's great. 14% said they would rather invest the extra money. Okay, love that. Again, as long as you have like your emergency fund, uh, that's great. 13% said they lack the discipline to save more. That's fixable. Mm -hmm. Um, but we didn't really ask, um, it's, it's kind of hard to explain why that saving parity exists, disparity exists when there's an income, uh, parity, right? Um, it might just be that folks are spending more, but I, I, I wouldn't want to say that I could explain it from an armchair. Yeah. I, I, it is an interesting, uh, it, it is an interesting conversation, folks. You know, John and I have talked about this, that in the past, we spent money, a lot more money to make ourselves feel better because of growing up in times and places where we didn't feel okay being ourselves, right? And then when we felt like it, we could, we finally had the money, we wanted to spend that money on making ourselves feel better. We didn't spend that money on saving for a down payment on our house. We didn't save, we, we didn't spend that money on investing. We spent that money on a new pair of jeans, brunch with our friends, vacation to Miami. We spent our money on those kinds of things that kind of made us fin finally feel like we were, we were okay. And I, I don't, I don't want to say that that's the sole thing that's happening here, but I, I think it, it is, I mean, we've seen the data, especially with millennials, we've seen the data where millennials have said that they are spending money that they don't have to keep up with their friends. And that's probably, that's a capital one statistic we've shared before on the podcast. Um, it, it's probably something similar that that's happening across our community. But I think one of the other things we have to remember is that by and large, queer folks gravitate towards neighborhoods and cities mm -hmm. in the country where things are just more expensive, right? We gravitate to cities where we feel safe. And because of that, a larger percentage of our money is being spent on necessities that allow us to feel safe. And maybe even some of that safety is mental health safety, right? We may be spending a larger percentage of our money on whether it's actual medications or it's, it's actual healthcare. It's possible that our community is spending money. You know, again, we're, we're, there's a whole host of reasons why this could be happening. Um, but I think it's, 
it, it is a, it, maybe it's something that as a community, we need to be starting to ask ourselves, why is there this disparity and should, should and can we do something about it? So we asked, you know, what are your top three financial priorities? What are your top three financial concerns? The most cited financial priorities were the two most cited financial priorities were the same as the two most cited financial concerns, more or less, and they were keeping up with the cost of living and saving more, right? So I don't think it would be inappropriate to hazard a guess that those two are somewhat connected. Mm -hmm. I think you raise great points that obviously all Americans are feeling the effects of inflation and the cost of living has increased over the past year. But again, that their LGBTQ folks might face unique challenges there um, based on for all of the reasons that you brought up. And it would be actually interesting to see if any of our numbers on savings amounts um, and financial priorities change if we filtered our results based on geography, right? So we can look at individual cities um, and we can look at the state level. Uh, so that would be fruit for further discussion, I think. Yeah. <laughs> More ways to slice this pie, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess, you know, David made the point, is there a way to... Is there a way if if these if this data is accurate, um, and based on the data that we we currently have, is is there something that we can do, um, or does it sort of take back to your, your suggestion earlier, Jack, that maybe those of us in personal finance and those of us in financial services maybe need to work on our, our messaging and making sure we're connecting with the community, or is it something else altogether? Yeah, I mean, just on the savings uh, component, my solution is is pretty simple and it's just autopilot it, right? Like if you feel as though they're, and this doesn't, I encourage everybody to take a look at their spending and build that budget and figure out what you're spending on. Did I really need to, you know, get those bottomless mimosas two weekends in a row, that type of thing. See where you can save. Are you watching um, me? <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a millennial, I uh, will say that I am, certainly guilty of overspending on brunches to keep up with the friends. Right. <laughs> uh, but, but my, my point is, you know, you can take an honest look at, at your credit card bill or, or your checking account statement, whatever it may be. And, you know, this wouldn't be necessarily my, my final recommendation to do, but you can kind of eyeball how much you think you could be saving more and just autopilot it. The day that you get your paycheck, make a set up an automatic transfer from your checking account to your savings account, or some companies uh, even let you split your paycheck um, and mm -hmm. send part of it directly into your savings account. So if you automate it, you don't have to think about it. Uh, and that just makes savings, saving that much easier. Um, you know, just because we're talking about budgeting and financial stress, uh, that was brought up that those statistics were also striking to me. Um, I think when, when folks talk about personal finance and budgeting, it can create, uh, anxiety of like being sucked into the spreadsheet. Right. And it can also create anxiety because it's like, does anybody really want to look at and document their spending from the past month and kind of have that conversation with themselves, you know, like maybe I shouldn't have bought that. Do I really, does it like, did I really need to make that purchase? Um, those are like tough conversations I feel like to have with yourself. Um, but I would just say that if you, if you make a budget timeline, you know, these are the things that I want to accomplish with my money in a year in five years and 10 years, whether it's, putting a kid through college, whether it's, uh, you know, throwing a big anniversary party, whether it's a big vacation, figuring out how much money you'll need for that. And then working backwards from there, that makes budgeting a lot easier because you're mm -hmm. budgeting with a goal in mind. You're not, uh, budgeting as like a, a form of, of negative self-reflection. Right. Um, More and proactive. then, yeah, exactly. Um, you're budgeting towards something versus against yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is it can be really difficult to sink those couple hours into figuring out your spending and where you can be saving and how much you can afford to save. 
But once you do that and you set things up on autopilot and you kind of have your goals in mind, it can be a really freeing sense. Maybe the experience itself wasn't all of that freeing, um, but you will feel better afterwards. And it's better than I think kicking the can down the road and waiting for some financial emergency that you weren't necessarily prepared for. Um, so that's my little sidebar on budgeting. No, I, I love that. And I'm going to piggyback off that. Um, but I, my response was going to be, you know, to not make it so hard. Um, this is what David and I have, have suggested in the past is sort of just, just become more money conscious, just become more aware. So I like what you're saying, you know, just whether it's $5 or 5% of your pay, just put it on autopilot, put it into a savings account. And I would, I would bet that most people, once they do that for a couple of paychecks, they'll, they'll look, they'll look at their finances and say, you know what, I could probably increase this another one or 2% or another one or $2. Um, and you'll start to realize that you've got more flexibility than you might think that you have. And if you, and that, that savings, you'll be surprised at how quickly that's, that saving starts to snowball. Um, and then you can use that for other things. It, it, one of the things that does highlight though, is that um, we have to be aware of and know what tools are out there mm -hmm. and use those tools. And that was the very first question of the study. And I think some of that data was a little surprising, right? The fact that two thirds of LGBT folks have a checking account and two thirds have a savings account, right? So that means that there's a, there's roughly a third of LGBT folks that aren't using those two basic tools, right? And so though you, when we use the tools that are at our disposal, we can complete the job the faster. We can, we can get there um, and, and, and actually achieve what we want or at least help minimize some of that stress, right? Minimizing, one of the, one of the best stress relievers is when you see your, your emergency savings account increasing, Huge. knowing that you have, you have that, whether it's 250 or $2,500, having not, that money set aside in case of an, of, of an emergency does help relieve some of that stress. Yeah. Just another example, you know, the same kind of logic applies to student loans. I've been paying off student loans since I graduated school. It's been many years and I have many, many years to go. And it's the same logic autopilot when you, mm -hmm. when you realize that you can put down that 1% of your paycheck. All right, bump it up to 2%. I'll just say in my experience, knowing that my loans will be paid off uh, even like six months earlier uh, is because I'm contributing a little bit more every month is a much better feeling than the fifth Margaret, the, the fifth mimosa, right? At, at bottomless brunch. It's just a much better feeling. Uh, and I, I, I would encourage folks to try an autopilot and then you live within those means and you realize that you can do it. And then you say, okay, let's take a step further. Um, if, if you have the ability to do so. Yeah. And I 100% agree with you. My anecdotal experience has always been that the second mimosa is the best experience. A little bit less than that is, isn't the best, isn't optimal, but more than that, it's starting to go downhill. <laughs> yeah. If you have less, you're kind of just, if, if you have, if you're a bottomless brunch and you're, you're having one mimosa of this, uh, you're not getting your money's worth. That's not bottomless. Yeah. You're not getting your money's worth. And then you're also just kind of tired, right? Um, at least that's been my experience. It's not a happy, not a happy place. Or you're the driver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to talk about, I take a little bit of umbrage with coming from the financial services industry. I think David feels the same way. We've spent, you know, the bulk of our careers in financial services. And so um, this is a little bit concerning. Um, nearly half, 48% of respondents reported having been discriminated against by someone in financial services. And that's 67% for uh, transgender respondents. And then 44% of those respondents attributed their lack of financial security, at least in part, to that discrimination. That it surprises me and it doesn't surprise me. Having worked in the industry and tried to help push for equality where we worked uh, or more inclusion where we worked, um, it doesn't surprise me. But, you know, we left corporate America like how many years ago? Seven years ago. And so it seems like not all, a whole lot has changed. 
Um, you know, and what was also frustrating is that we see some of these companies that we worked for or worked were in the same industry as they're always at pride praise. They've always got banners on their, their logos. They're always getting 100s on the HRC uh, corporate equality index. So um, I'm curious of, of, you know, you're, you're both kind of also in the industry. What, what, why do we think that there's this, this disconnect between what the financial services seems to be doing by outward appearance and how it's making LGBTQ people feel? Yeah, it's a great question. I um, was wouldn't necessarily say surprised by those numbers, um, but they definitely are notable to me. It's a problem that needs to be addressed, right? Um, clearly, um, you know, I think on the on corporate policy versus uh, our survey results, I think. A lot of financial services companies have been really forward leaning um, in terms of policy, and they've set a great standard for corporate policy uh, with regards to diversity and inclusion and equality and all of those efforts. Um, and so I don't want to bash any of that. I just think there's probably, um, and you know, I'm I'm probably not the best person to speak to this, but there's probably a difference between personal interaction um, and corporate policies and actions, right? So your your policy can be amazing. Let's see how it's implemented on the ground in every instance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community also probably face unique challenges. Like for example, if you undergo a gender transition that can create paperwork difficulties uh, and I paperwork difficulties is probably under underplaying it right but it can create uh, barriers that shouldn't exist um, and can make it more difficult uh, you know if you've had a name change or a gender change uh, it can make it more difficult for you to, to get the service that you feel you otherwise should receive um, so there might be some of that uh, going on as well. I think this is an area where we want to get some personal stories and really try and figure out what's driving this. I think there's also, you know, I don't want to say definitely, but I'm fairly confident that there is kind of that mess gap um, that I was talking about with and that the company that they might want to bank with or set up a brokerage with shares the values that they do, right? Like does a fund that you're interested in investing with, you know, are they all, are they okay with investing in companies that have a really poor human rights record? Mm -hmm. Are they okay with investing in companies that have dismissed uh, complaints about LGBTQ discrimination in their workplace? Etc. Um, and so you maybe don't really think of that type of thing uh, as discrimination, but it really is. It turns folks away from your product. It makes it feel. It makes them feel as though your product isn't for them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think we want to we want to dive deeper here and and get some personal stories and and see what's really happening. Yeah, I think getting the personal stories is is definitely really important. Do you have any additional thoughts? Well, I, I just I just have to go back to something I, I've I've shared on the podcast before. Um, when when I was working in financial services, and I would go into the office where individuals would we meet face to face with financial advisors, and I just looked around the office. And I watched the interaction and I was in social uh, settings with those people because John and I were close friends with a number of people who, who uh, well, with a couple of people, but then we were inside that group of finance with, with other financial advisors. And what always came across to me is that the average financial advisor to me felt like the guy that beat the shit out of me when I was a kid in high school. I, I just kind of got this, the, 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 the mentality and the way in which they carried themselves and the jokes that they told just were reminiscent of the guys in high school who were typically the ones that were doing most of the bullying. And, and for me personally, that just made me say, I don't, I don't know, but I, I don't know if I want to work with a financial advisor. Right? And 
Um, and so it, it wasn't for, for me, it wasn't, uh, that there was specific discrimination, although John and I did experience discrimination in the workplace, but it, it wasn't the, the specific discrimination. It was the perception that this is a place where discrimination could occur. And because right. of that, I think a lot of LGBT folks, especially if you're gender nonconforming, if you're a gender nonconforming woman, you know, if you're if you are a more mask presenting woman, uh, you just don't feel comfortable in those kind of settings. If you're a femme presenting man, you don't feel comfortable in those settings. And so, this is, I, I think, a, a, it's. I think this maybe speaks to the reason why. 44% of those respond 44% of those respondents said that they the the discrimination the perception of discrimination is what was holding them back mm -hmm. financially from making progress right it, they attributed the lack of their lack of progress to that if you don't have if you're not you don't feel comfortable going in and talking to a financial advisor and you don't feel comfortable making investing decisions on your own you're just simply not going to invest Right. And so that's going to put you at a disadvantage financially. And I think that that's the, the pale male stale perception of the financial services industry. It, it, and, and even the, even the banking, although the banking, I think the banking industry has changed because a lot of the, the front facing individuals in banking have, that's where we are seeing a lot more diversity. Uh, but um, I think just the overall in the industry, there just has this, just this historic, this is the place for straight white men and straight white men who historically have been the ones who have discriminated against you in a variety of settings. Let me just uh, totally agree with everything that you've said. And we've done um, earlier this year, we actually did research on the importance of financial role models in underrepresented communities and oh. found that folks in underrepresented communities, so non-white, non-straight, were way, way, way less likely to have a financial role model um, that they could relate to. Mm -hmm. Someone who looked like them, um, shared their values, et cetera. They, and folks within those underrepresented communities who didn't have a financial role model that they could relate to were across the board, less likely to have an uh, investing account, retirement account, savings account, be confident in their financial decisions, et cetera. And I think everything that we've just discussed shows how important um, actual inclusivity is in the financial space um, and how important it is to have role models um for folks in this space because otherwise yeah you, you really they really do just get um left behind um and the data plays that out <laughs>